so. Um, well, listen carefully, because we're going to just start the chapter and then warm up and introduce the class by looking at the first verse. It's, just, it's a <coughs> natural break, and so it, it's happened to recap what we've done throughout the whole chapter. We're starting a fresh chapter. But there's an important link here. Um, imam viva sate yogam proktavan aham avyayam. Aham proktavan avyayam. I spoke this imperishable yoga. Yogam proktavan aham avyayam. I spoke this imperishable yoga. This now, what imperishable yoga is Krishna referring to? I spoke. Well, let me read the whole verse. But that's the first question. I spoke this imperishable yoga. Yoga here could be science, systematic understanding of how to connect. Um, vivasate. I spoke this to vivasvat. To the to the sun god. I spoke this um, imam, this yoga imam yogam this yoga proktavan. I declared it aham. I did this vivasate to vivasvan, and I did this uh, previously. Proktavan means I, I I said it before. And obviously, it happened many many, you know thousands, millions of years before with the birth of the universe. Aviyam, and this knowledge is also inexhaustible, it's eternal. So, imam yogam, imam yogam avyayam, this imperishable yoga, proktavan, I declared it, vivasate, unto vivasvat. Vivasvan manave. Praha. Vivasvat spoke it to Manu. Vivasvat, the sun god, the dawn of creation, spoke to Manu, Manu, the father of mankind. Vivasvat spoke it to, you know, essentially to Adam in this scenario. Manur ikshvakave abravit and Manu spoke it to Ikshvaku, his son, who was also a great, great king. So, Imam Yogam Avyayam, this eternal yoga, Proktavan Aham, I spoke it, Vivasate, to Vivasvan. Vivasvan manave praha. Vivasvan spoke it to Manu. Manu ikshvakave abravit. And Manu explained it to ikshvaku. Now to appreciate this verse, ideally, you would know who Vivasvan was, who Manu was, who um, ikshvaku was. And so without knowing these players it's difficult to appreciate the impact of what Krishna is saying but to, to, to like um, give you guys a little entrance imagine if you were Greek you were in Alexander's army and then your friend told you that I spoke this wisdom to Zeus at the dawn of creation, and Zeus spoke it to Apollo, and Apollo spoke it to whoever Apollo's son was, you know? You follow? It would be like, it's quite, it's a big claim. That's a pretty big claim. 
I mean, I somehow or other, being in charge of a, of a church by the ocean, the ocean traditionally, at least in Southern California, I don't know everywhere, but I know actually the ocean everywhere. If you look at like New Jersey and you look at the Jersey Shore, somehow the ocean brings out roughneck, low-class, unhoused, unkempt people. And I, I think it, there's, a, there's a good reason for it. If you have to be unhoused and you're a drug addict or an alcoholic and you're living on the streets, where do you want to live? There's all, all, the, all the stupid unhoused people are like in downtown L.A., right? But there's just no reason for it, right? I mean, there's a community there, but, you know. <laughs> exactly. And so what you get is you get the real clever, motivated, industrious, entrepreneurial unhoused people that make it all the way here. You have to not only be on the streets, but you got to be savvy enough to catch a bus to walk all the way out here with your uh, um, shopping cart. You, you know what I mean? It takes some work. It's not like you just, you know, homeless people just snap their fingers and wind up here. Although, I believe, I believe that Somebody from Washington, D.C., I want to say it's Ronald Reagan, but it would have been before he became president. But some statesman from Washington, D.C., put all the homeless people from Washington, he gave them free bus tickets. And I, I want to say the late 70s, early 80s, to San Diego. He just, just spent, you know, $50,000 or whatever it was, and just gave hundreds of homeless people bus tickets to San Diego and created a huge homeless problem in San Diego. So they might not have been the most industrious, but some of them were. And so you know, they made it out here. And, they, they're, they're, and so I've regularly met people who tell me they're Jesus. You know, like, I, like that's happened at least 20 times, at least once a year, sometimes three times a year. People will tell me they're Jesus. I, I meet people regularly with, with delusions of grandeur, but you know, sometimes I just get people just straight telling me, I am Jesus, bow down before me, don't touch me, don't you know who I am? Like that kind of stuff. Um, somebody makes that claim to you, it's, it's no joke. And keep in mind, Krishna has been incognito up till now. He hasn't been displaying his divinity. So this verse in a lot of ways, marks a big shift in the Gita because Krishna is beginning to assert his godhood. There's been some foreshadowing in previous chapters. Krishna spoke about Sharanam Anvicha taking shelter, and he talked about uh, Mai, uh, mats, Matsarva Karmani Mai. The, uh, sannyasya, surrender all your works to me. There were verses, uh, yukta, asita, yukta asita matpadaha, sit with me as the highest object. These verses have happened in the last couple of chapters, couple per chapter. Some verses indicating Krishna's divinity have been spoken in each chapter. But they, they're almost like uh, red herrings. They don't fit. They're just thrown in there and it's uh, there's no explanation given for them and Krishna just moves on to the next subject but drops it in there like a bit of foreshadowing this chapter starting with this verse Krishna begins to assert his divinity and of course given that Krishna is God in the Gita and that the bulk of the Gita is about Krishna speaking as God this is significant. Now, a lot of times when people say they're God, in neo-Hindu traditions, modern-day Hindu traditions, 
it's pretty common for people to say that they're God. Whether it's a Sai Baba or there was a Maharajji in the 70s. We had a guy here who said he was God. He used to come to, to the restaurant with his disciples. And he would claim he's God, an incarnation of Krishna. I mean, I like... I've met so many incarnations. I, I one person came to the temple and and gave me her card, and it's her name. She her name was Govinda, and the, you know, like you say, like you know, you know, Sri Devi Radha, licensed clinical social worker, right? So her card said Govinda, supreme universal being. That was the card, and she said, "Hey, you're collecting a lot of money here for me, and I think we have to talk about." <laughs> How, how we divide it up. I kid you not. I kid you not. I, I kid you not. Uh, so, it's, it's quite common in neo-Hindu circles for someone to say, you know, I'm God, I'm an avatar. Even that term avatar is used if you aren't happy with the way you look and so you make a cartoon caricature of yourself that makes your skin look smoother than it actually is and makes you look more fit than you actually are you make a little caricature of yourself of how you'd like to present yourself to the world they call that an avatar and it's like a fake version of yourself that you then you know present in your online life. Um, the word avatar means, literally means one who crosses down. Tar means to cross and ava means down. So someone who crosses down from a higher place to a lower place is an avatar. Um, so it's very common and, and I think usually when people say I'm God or when the devotees of a given incarnation you know say my guru is God or something like that they generally speaking understand it to mean that their guru is enlightened that he's attained some kind of Buddhahood and that is like a that's there in Buddhism so it's there in the Bodha Dharma and it's 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 quite common it's sort of worked its way down into the collective understanding of Eastern spiritualist type people, neo-Hindu, neo-Buddhist type people. Um, uh, there was a, a, a movie actor named Steven Seagal who acted in a bunch of action movies um, who did not a fight but, you know, told a tall tale that he was a great fighter and worked his way into action movies. He was actually quite a celebrity in the 80s. Now he's like a fat slob who can hardly, like, you know, do anything. And he has, he has to be careful, like, that the angles, when he, they take photos of him, they take the right angles because he's just gotten so morbidly obese. It's like a joke that he's an action hero. He always wears these, like, caftan-type deals to cover up his morbid obesity. But... Um, uh, he uh, uh, um, he paid some money to uh, um, to get declared some kind of reincarnated Buddha type personality, and so he got somebody in Tibet to declare that oh he's a reincarnated Rinpoche type thing and. So it's, it's quite common nowadays. People want to be an avatar. They declare themselves an avatar. And most people don't even think that means you're vegetarian necessarily or, you know, or that you're sober even or that you're not a womanizer. But somehow it means that you're just wise, oftentimes divorced from your practical behavior. So it's, it's, it's very common for people to claim, yeah, I'm enlightened, I'm advanced, although everything about their personality and their behavior would suggest otherwise. And people just take it so cheaply that a lot of times people don't even question it. Oh, I don't know. You know who knows, right? It's kind of an antinomian type thing. All, I think that actually kind of comes from Christianity. You can sort of do anything 
if you believe in Jesus hard enough and that's it, that you can completely divorce your actions in this world for your, from your standing in that world. Um, so oftentimes when people claim I'm God or I'm an avatar or I'm enlightened um, or I'm some kind of reincarnated saint, there's just nothing attached to it. It's just a claim that's just made in thin air and it has no, there's nothing to substantiate that the claim may have any validity. You don't require any evidence to support such a claim. In fact, people don't even, can't, even, don't, can't even think of what that might, evidence might look like and it just becomes just sort of a blank check that you write that no one ever bothers to, to look at and say, does this make sense? Do you look like the kind of person that has that much money in the bank? You walk around, I have a check, I have $10 million. You know, but nobody bothers to know, it's like, you know, you're, you're, you're eating out of a garbage can. Nobody bothers to like, notice that. And they just, they just, you know, take it at face value. Don't bother questioning it. Um, so that's certainly standard in neo-Hindu circles. And I think it probably comes from, or at least it has a corollary in Buddhism, and this idea of reincarnated, Buddha type people and because Buddhism doesn't believe in God per se then anybody can become the Buddha and become you know attain Buddhahood um, and so there's this idea and then it gets divorced from your actions and you can kind of do anything Krishna when he claims his divinity doesn't mean it like that he means more on the omnipotent omnipresent, omnibenevolent, omniscient, supreme Lord who birthed the cosmos. The singularity. Not that I've attained a certain stage of self-realization that then qualifies me to say I'm God because my definition of God is to be self-realized. Rather, I'm God in the classical sense of I am the origin of the cosmos. Essentially, I'm the father of time and gravity and the source of all reality. So it's, you see the two different levels? A lot of times people will throw down that avatar God card, but what they really mean is I'm self-realized and I'm self-realized in a way that doesn't require any evidence, any lifestyle modifications. That's not what's being said here. Krishna's making a straight up psycho claim that he is the origin of all reality. And his, his, he's, he's just warming up. It's going to get worse. But his, his opening gambit in the chapter is I explain this eternal science at the dawn of creation to the sun god who spoke it to the first man who then spoke it to the first king. I'm the parent of, you know, all knowledge. Now, what's the knowledge that he's talking about here? I spoke this knowledge. What knowledge? The knowledge you just talked about nothing attached to. That would that would be the most reasonable answer. That he just explained how lust creates problems and the structure of how to how to defend oneself against lust and how it's what drags people down. This statement is either a preface to what's going to come next or it's a, an end cap to what came before it. Either one of them works. You guys obviously can't say what it's prefacing because we haven't read the chapter yet, but it certainly works as an end cap to what was just spoken. And that's a very reasonable explanation. And that is a nice segue from chapter 3 to chapter 4. Krishna's claim that, hey, take what I said to you seriously. It's fundamental wisdom about the nature of reality. In fact, it's eternal wisdom, and I spoke it at the dawn of creation millions of years ago. You follow this? It's, it's also an interesting question, but if somebody did make a claim, I am God, what evidence would you reasonably expect to see? It's, it's an interesting question, and I think it's an important question. If somebody, you know, somebody says, can you prove God exists? Generally, my answer will be yes. I'm, I'm always keen to take that challenge up. But my answer will also be, what will you accept as evidence? 
I don't want a moving goalpost where I provide you with arguments that are cogent and sound and compelling and based on evidence that you can point to in this world and the best possible explanation and I make a good argument for the existence of God that's at least better than the argument for the non-existence of God and then you say, well, that's not proof. Well, then the question becomes, what would you accept as proof? Well, I want science. Okay, like what's the scientific evidence you want of God's existence? Well, what do you want? I want you to show him to me right now. You get it? Like, I, like, you have, like, like it's like a habeas corpus, like present the body, you know? Like it's, it's, you, know, you have to, can't just hold somebody in detention indefinitely. They have to be presented to the court to be arraigned. It's like going back to the Magna Carta. But of course, that would indicate that God was beneath you such that you could summon him. You follow? It would also indicate that God's a material being because God could be presented to your material eyes and that you're qualified. Like, for instance, like, let's say you were to say, well, let's say, I don't know, some, you know, like string theory, like the legitimacy of string theory, why it's a compelling theory. Let's say just some ignorant person, drunkard, fool, uneducated, on the street, child, said, prove to me string theory exists. It doesn't work like that. You've got to take some introductory physics courses and get into theoretical physics and look at all the evidence and, and then you, know, you build a case. You, you can explain it to somebody. Special theory of relativity. You can explain stuff to people. But it's not that you can just explain it to somebody with no prerequisite knowledge. I mean, if you look at, like, I don't know, the language of calculus, you know, trigonometry. It has all sorts of sines and cosines and stuff. That if you haven't studied that, you don't even know what the, you don't even know what the language means. When you talk about proof, a lot of times what we skip over is that there is qualification on the part of the person who is going to adjudicate and weigh the evidence and determine the validity of the arguments. And not everybody is qualified to, let's say, weigh in on what a book in Japanese is about. And so if God existed, God was a spiritual being, and we had free will, these things have to be factored into the equation. If God was fundamentally superior to you, how, you know, how does an ant understand a human being? And so I don't think it's wrong to want evidence. I do think it's wrong to want evidence of God's existence and consider evidence of God's existence to be like evidence of what the temperature is, where you just go and buy, you know, break out your iPhone and like look it up. And the same way when you measure temperature, it's different if you want to measure, let's say, air pressure. You need a barometer to measure air pressure versus a thermometer to measure temperature. And so when we want to prove things or demonstrate things, we look for appropriate tools, appropriate pieces of evidence, that are discernible to qualified people, and then you make an argument. And so you can say, I can present you with a reasonable theory of God's existence and good evidence to warrant you investigating God's existence, but if you have free will, then you couldn't be forced to accept God's existence. There would have to be some kind of voluntary feature. And this idea that, you know, well, this is now subjective and this is no longer objective. The thing is, phenomenology exists. For instance, how do you prove that you are conscious to someone else? I know I'm conscious. I'm having a conscious experience of reality. I have thoughts and feelings and a 3D movie playing in my head not only with you know three dimensions but, but also with things like smell and taste and feeling and emotion it's the most undoubtable thing in existence cogito ergo sum I think therefore I am 
I doubt, therefore I think, therefore I am. It's the least valuable thing, my own existence, because the entire rest of the world is only perceivable to me because I exist. Therefore, my existence is the first gateway to every other aspect of reality. Did you follow this? How can you prove to me that you are conscious? Well, you can speak to me, but maybe you're just, maybe it's a program that you're running. Maybe you're a philosophical zombie. Maybe you are programmed to respond to stimuli in normative ways, but my consciousness isn't merely my ability to respond to stimuli. It's my own internal experience of reality called qualia. And it is inherently, and here's a critical point, it's inherently subjective. Consciousness is always experienced in the first person. The symptoms of consciousness are not consciousness because they could theoretically be programmed into a robot. Like a robot could say, I see a red light, but it doesn't necessarily mean the robot is actually seeing the red light the same way I'm seeing a red light. And so there is a subjective, fundamentally subjective, basic aspect of consciousness that is irreducibly the core ingredient of consciousness. Consciousness is fundamentally subjective. It's experienced in the first person and it cannot be shared with anybody else. In fact, if we share consciousness, we agree that we like a movie or we agree that we like a certain color or we agree that we like a certain geographical location. We share some collective, you know, synergistic something vibe. We like you know, take mushrooms or something, vibe out together. That's always a secondary level of consciousness, ever dependent on the primary, fundamentally subjective, unshareable aspect of consciousness. Do you follow this? In fact, you know, our language is our symbols of what we're experiencing. Approximations at best of what we experience. They're not the actual thing. Our description of the sunset is different than our own personal experience of the beauty of a given sunset. Our writing down of our thoughts is different than our actual profound thoughts with all of their nuances, the way they occur to us within a given context, privately, intimately, as we're able to trace out in shorthands thousands of threads in different directions simultaneously practically. How do you prove to me that you're conscious? With objective empirical evidence. Empirical evidence in this case means objective evidence means it's not dependent on subjectivity. It can be demonstrated to a third party. How do you objectively to a third party demonstrate consciousness? You don't. Something exists, the most basic feature of reality, and it's inherently subjective, and it defies third-party empirical evidence. We have evidence of some of the correlates of consciousness, some of the symptoms of consciousness, but that's different than for sure verifying that someone's actually conscious. Therefore, our acceptance of people as being conscious is based on an analogous understanding of the world where we know we're conscious, we see other people behaving in similar ways to ourselves, and we accept, based on those symptoms, which are nowhere near demonstrable, empirically verifiable, objective evidence, we just accept, yes, other people are conscious like I am. That means that the most basic features of reality cannot be empirically demonstrated to other people. They can only be subjectively aware to you and some correlates of them or derivative symptoms of them can be shown to other people such that we become convinced and we're like, yeah, okay, you're conscious, I accept. 
That indicates that empiricism isn't the only way to acquire real knowledge about the world. That also indicates that empiricism on its own is an incomplete map to understand the world and our place in the world and reality. And that reality has certain objective as well as subjective features. And when you get into the subjective features of reality, which are the basis of all reality, because without being conscious, you don't experience any other aspect of reality. There are every other objective aspect of reality is dependent on your fundamentally subjective experience of reality as the most primary part of existence. And so now not only is consciousness and subjectivity an irreducible facet of reality, it is the most primary feature of reality. And all objective third party, empirically observable and demonstrable reality is dependent on first party, subjective, phenomenological experience. And in fact, there's a whole branch of philosophy called phenomenology. There's a whole branch of philosophy called philosophy of mind because this point I just made to you is so obviously vexing and problematic for an empirical worldview that they had to develop other branches of philosophy to deal with it. And it wasn't like this wasn't understood way back when. Rene Descartes understood this. That's why he broke the world up into a phenomenal world and a noumenal world. That's why he broke it up into two worlds. A phenomenal world and a numinous world. A world of noumen. A, a world of mind and a world of you know, objective reality. Because by breaking the world up into two, he could then park the mind aspect of the mind-body problem and just focus on the body aspect and there could be huge advances in science because they weren't trying to come up with a universal theory that accounted for both but now we have two separate fields of study one objective the other one subjective but they both represent reality in fact the subjective one more represents fundamental reality move to the side so I don't have to look at you behind this the computer the, the phone come on man you should know better do you guys follow that so now when somebody asks you, like, prove consciousness, well, that's not the same as proving, let's say, the temperature or the air pressure. It's a much longer conversation. I can give you reasons to believe in consciousness, that I'm conscious, that other people are conscious, but you're not going to get the same kind of hard evidence that you want because there's aspects of reality that defy that hard, objective evidence but they nonetheless exist and are real and you experience them every day. Did you guys follow that? Good argument, huh? What do you think? Questions on this? So now, when somebody says, you know, does God exist? Okay, sure, but let's talk about what's going to be acceptable as evidence. What's a win for me here? How do I win this debate? I want to give you spiritual evidence of God's existence. I want to give you the same kind of evidence of God's existence I give you for the existence of consciousness. I want to extrapolate on where consciousness likely came from. I want to introduce consciousness as an irreducible feature of reality. I want to build off of that. I don't see any reason why that's unreasonable or illogical or nonsensical or even unscientific. <clears throat> but whenever somebody asks you for evidence, the next question out of your mouth should be, what would you accept as evidence? And let's have a debate about what good evidence would look like and what would constitute a win so we don't just wind up in the weeds moving the goalpost unlimitedly as you ask me for you know, something like a square circle. So Krishna's going to present himself here as God. Now you know, what kind of evidence are you going to get out of a book that Krishna's God? It's like it's on pages. And so what we're really looking at is we're looking at a hypothesis. We're looking at a theory. We're looking at a conception of divinity, which is being put down on the pages of the Gita, an idea about the nature of God. The proof of the existence of God will not be found in the book. The proof of the existence of God will be found in your own life. 
as you do the work, as you do the experiment. I don't want to find proof for God's existence in a book because then it's like everybody else's book gets to be used as evidence. I don't mind, you know, logical arguments could be written down and I could think through them and do a thought experiment with those logical arguments and make sure they make sense, like a formula. But then at some point you've got to test the formula out. You got like a Pythagorean theorem or something like that. You gotta go test it out. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore, you know, Socrates, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore, Socrates is immortal. I gotta test. I gotta make sure all men are mortal. I gotta make sure Socrates is a man. I have to have some real world experience in order to appreciate when something is then written down formulaically in a book, even the Pythagorean theorem. You gotta go out and draw a few triangles. And so inference, starting with, you know, what's in the world, experimenting with what's in the world, is always the cornerstone of all philosophy. Then you can begin to abstract from your experience of the world. Or you can come up with theories and then go back into the world to test them. So the Gita, in that sense, is a lab manual made to be used in this world. I don't want to look to the Gita for the entirety of my experience of God. Rather, I want to use the Gita as a, as, a, as, a, as a lab manual to then inform my experiments and help me then you know, think through my own experience of the world, my own experience of my consciousness, where consciousness likely came from, the principle of sufficient reason. There's, there's always you know, a source of everything that exists. There should also be a source of my consciousness, a singularity. That singularity must also possess consciousness if I can't arrive at consciousness through some kind of like, you know, manipulation of chemicals. It's truly different and unique. And it must be there to cornerstone the universe, like a fundamental force or a fundamental particle of existence. And therefore I should find in my singularity those fundamental particles, those fundamental forces existing. So I don't find Krishna's arguments in this chapter to be particularly compelling. What is compelling is that Krishna's making statements that he's got. Now, if I have a belief in God, if I figured that one out by my, you know, 50 years in this world, through thinking about the world carefully, through looking at the nature of reality, and specifically the nature of consciousness, and I've realized there must be a conscious source of all reality, and the Big Bang, the singularity, must have come from something which possessed consciousness, Then when I read the Gita, I can start to see, well, does the conception of God outlined in these next pages of the Gita, is it congruent with a healthy, reasonable, philosophically astute, intellectually respectable, holds water, passes muster conception of God? You, let me say it again. I already believe in God. I took the onus of that. I have to have some responsibility for figuring that one out. I'm not looking for a blind, it says so in the Bible kind of situation. I've arrived at that idea that there's a higher power and I can trace out why I believe in a higher power. And I began to give you guys a deep dive into the beginning of that argument. Try to bring you guys up to a high level at what the beginning of that argument looks like. Namely, the irreducibility of consciousness fundamentalness of consciousness and then beginning to ask questions where does consciousness come from and what would that singularity look like now I've arrived at the idea that there must be a creator and of course the creator must be personal because I'm a person that's another one the creator has abilities and thoughts and it must be a person maybe not a person with a body made of flesh and blood like me perhaps a spiritual person with a spiritual form I begin to think about once I've, you know, arrived at the irreducibility of consciousness, the fundamentalness of consciousness, the ontological basicness of consciousness, and I start to think about <clears throat> what that does to my conception <coughs> of the source of all reality, of the singularity. And now I've, I've got this idea that there's a personal, because I'm a person, so where, where do I get my personhood from? If God wasn't a person, where did I get my personality from? Where did I get my individuality from? Certainly being an individual is better than not being an individual. 
we're limited by our individuality, but that's, that's just our iteration. I can easily conceive of an unlimited individual. Someone who possesses thought, the capacity for love. Of course, a God who wasn't an individual wouldn't be able to love. You start to work through this stuff. You start to think, okay, what would the nature of God be like? And you've done some work. You put in some work to qualify yourself to appreciate the evidence. Then you can go really read a religious text and you can say, hey, this is a good conception of divinity. This is a reasonable conception of divinity. Or this is a beautiful, fantastic conception of divinity that blows my mind and goes far beyond what I ever would have figured out on my own. This is revelatory. These are my people, this is my tribe. Or this is an awful conception of divinity. This makes no sense. An eternal hell? A jealous God? What's wrong with you people? One lifetime? You go to hell forever? Come on. How would an all-good, all-powerful God create an eternal hell? That doesn't make any sense. Well, it says so in the Bible. A, no it doesn't. And B, if it did, you just dissed your text. Because just saying it says so in my book doesn't get you out of jail with me. I'm not saying it says so in my book. You don't get to say it either. And so I like the idea, by the time you get to this section of the Gita, some of these ideas we just talked about today are fresh in your mind, and you can look at the Krishna conception of divinity as it's beginning to be articulated in the pages of the Gita. And the miracle of Krishna incarnating in this world to reveal a divine legacy to the world at a certain point that that can be appreciated. Like, what a beautiful revelation. What a beautiful idea. Do you guys follow this? So, First claim is Krishna was around from the beginning, and his knowledge is super important, and that's going to make your ears peak, peak up. You know, you know, it's going to peak your interest. It's going to make your ears perk up. It's going to peak your interest, peak your curiosity. You're going to listen more carefully. Evam parampara praptam imram rajashayo viduhu. These King seers, they knew. They knew this. Evam parampara praptam. Having received it through parampara from one person to another, it was passed on from guru to disciple. Having, having received it through that chain of parampara, passing information on, these great seer kings of the past, they knew it, this science. Sakalena iha mahata yogo nashta parantapa. But this yoga was destroyed over a long period of time in this world. It degraded over a long period of time. Sa eva ayam maye, maya te adya. Today, this is being yoga prokta poratna. Today, I am speaking this yoga. This yoga has been spoken by me to you today. Adya, today. Te, to you, maya, by me, I am this. Prokta is spoken, parata, this ancient science is spoken by me to you. Yoga, this ancient science of yoga is being spoken by me to you today. The one that was lost. I'm speaking it to you now. I'm reinvigorating the world with this divine wisdom. Bhakto asi me saka cheti rahasyam hietat uttamam. This greatest of all secrets, this ancient yoga, is being spoken by me to you today. 
because you are my devotee. Bhakto asi, because you are a devotee, may, you are my devotee. Sakam cheti, and you're my friend. You're my friend, and you're my devotee, and therefore I'm speaking this highest secret, this ancient science of yoga to you today. I instructed this imperishable science of yoga to the sun god, Vivasvan, and Vivasvan instructed it to Manu, the father of mankind, and Manu, in turn, instructed it to Ikshvaku. <clears throat> this supreme science was thus received through the chain of disciplic succession, and the saintly kings understood it in that way. But in course of time, the succession was broken, and therefore the science as it is appears to be lost. That very ancient science of the relationship with the Supreme is today told by me to you because you're my devotee as well as my friend and can therefore understand the transcendental mystery of this science. Now Arjuna said, Aparam bhavata janma. <laughs> Your birth was not earlier. <laughs> Param janma vivasvata. Vivishvan's birth was earlier than yours. You weren't born before Vivishvan. He was born before you. Katam etat vijaniyam. How should I understand this? <laughs> Katam, like literally means how. Eta, this, this thing you just said to me. Vijaniya, how should I understand this thing that you've just said to me? Tvam adao proktavanati, that you're speaking to me today. That you've spoken today. How should I understand this? I, of course, I love this question because it's like a legitimate, reasonable doubt to have. And so Arjun is, is, you know, not just, yes, I accept. It's a, like, legitimately, it's a reasonable doubt. You know, like Joseph Smith says, okay, you know, the Jewish people walked across the Bering Strait from the Middle East through Siberia and brought these golden tablets to Utah. And it's like, yeah, there's no, you can't walk across the Bering Strait been underwater for thousands and thousands of years since way before the Jews. Like, are you sure you did that? And then like, where are these golden tablets? Oh, they're, they're, they, they, they disappeared. Well, come on, man. How am I supposed to? You told me there's golden tablets. Like, at least you should be able, you said the tablets are here, so at least you should, you should be able to show them to me. It's not like you said you saw it in the Akashic record. You told me the golden tablets are, and they were in some kind of reformed Aramaic. Like, when did you study reformed Aramaic, man? I don't you know, is that being taught like at universities in the 1800s? Did you even go to university? And you're marrying all these women, walking across the middle of nowhere into Utah, like making a harem. You talk about golden tablets and reformed Aramaic, and nobody's seen the tablets. You got some fanciful tale about the Jewish people walking across the Barren Strait. I don't know. I got some doubts. Like, I'm all for the funny underwear and, you know, the cheesy neoclassical furniture, um, but, and, you know, tithing and stuff like that, but some of these core elements that you're pointing to as your evidence of the legitimacy, I don't see them. And so if Krishna was to have spoken this wisdom, then you should be really old at that point, but Arjun sees him as his friend just on the battlefield. It seems like a reasonable doubt to have. Now, let's just, before we get back to the scheduled programming, we should stop for a minute and appreciate what's been said so far. 
Number one, we have a pretty benevolent deity. Because although entropy exists and degrades everything in the material world, the deity continually reappears to reframe the wisdom so that that wisdom is always available to sincere seekers. Would an all-good God want to always make wisdom available in the world? Would human beings with free will be able to mess that up and destroy that wisdom by adulterating it as they were passing it on from one to another? Yes, especially if we have free will. If we live in a non-deterministic universe, especially we'd be able to mess it up. We have some degree of power. Would, would an all-good God want to come back into the world and touch things up and top off the gas tank? Sure. Could an all-powerful God do that? Yes. So this idea of God coming back into the world to make that wisdom available is congruent with an all-good, all-powerful God. It's a good idea. These ideas like everything's lost, now everybody's going to hell, and there was no way to go to heaven before us, I think those ideas are kind of garbage. Because an all-good God would always want knowledge to be available. An all-powerful God could make it always available. Now, would an all-good, all-powerful God, could an all-powerful God force that truth down your throat? The answer is yes. All-powerful means he could. Would an all-good God force that thing down your, tr your throat? No, because it would mean there's no possibility of love, because love has to be given freely, therefore we'd have to have free will, and therefore God wouldn't be able to put too much pressure on us to believe or to follow because that would get in the way of free will and would ruin the possibility of love and be a much worse universe. A universe with the possibility of evil, but also with the possibility of love, is barely a deterministic universe without any possibility of evil and no possibility of love. So even this idea that I'm telling you because you're my devotee, because you're favorable, because you're a bhakta, bhakta asime, because you are my devotee, you're my devotee. That's why you're getting this knowledge. That's far out, right? That's a pretty, that's a pretty good, good idea that should be there in a properly framed tradition. So Krishna's given some good initial ideas and Arjuna has some good initial doubts. And I don't think like this chapter should generate faith in anybody. I think if you already have faith, this chapter will be appreciable as a good conception of divinity, a reasonable contender for a legit conception of divinity that you could appreciate. I do not think this chapter generates faith. Rather, if one already has faith, they'll be able to appreciate the brilliance and the beauty and the elegance of the chapter. But if you want to find faith and you don't have faith, we got to start a little earlier on. Now, Arjun, he didn't have to start earlier on. He was right there with Krishna. He could ask these questions. He could put that stuff before the master, and Krishna was working with him in real time. But for all of us, we have to go into the laboratories of our own life and pray. And as much as I hate on the, hated on the Mormons today, because I'm just, you know, a hater of other traditions, um, I do remember reading something in the Book of Mormon that, that, that the, the missionaries are very, very fond of quoting, where they say, just cry out to God and pray. And, and wisdom will come and faith will come and you'll realize something. Just open your heart up and pray. And God will help you. you know, Jesus will help you. I, I always appreciate that because they're willing, they're, they're a religion and they're willing to put their religion on their sleeves and they're willing to wear their heart on their sleeves and they're willing to say, hey, <clears throat> let's pray together. Let's open ourselves up to being receptive to this divine illumination that is available to us. That's a piece of the puzzle. You have to get in the lab and do the experiment. And in a religious tradition, that experiment, if you're an ant trying to understand a person, you know, it's only by the grace of that person you're going to understand them. And so maybe we can never understand God with a Tower of Babel or a Stairway to Heaven, but an omnipotent deity who is omnibenevolent could certainly give us an understanding. 
And so then religion becomes this exercise in becoming receptive and becoming thoughtful and becoming open to evidence and developing finely tuned faculties to perceive the evidence. And there is a time for crying out and asking. You know, you, all the logical arguments in the world get you to a place where you can confidently jump in the lab and with excitement and anticipation and some fear and some doubt, but more excitement than doubt, jump in the laboratory and do the experiment. Chant, pray, cry out, take a step towards Krishna, see what happens. That core idea of those cheesy, wet behind the ears, pious but not really, Mormon missionaries are still eating meat, nonsense. But that, that core idea, I think they got right. I don't think Arjun's doubt is wrong. I don't think people having doubt in the existence of God is wrong. And I think the best thing we can do is give people a reason to experiment and try. We can make strong arguments for the reasonability of God's existence, for the superiority of the idea, the idea that God exists over the idea that God doesn't exist. We can find meaning in the universe. We can show that meaning to others. We can demonstrate it with our own lives. In many ways, we become the most compelling evidence for God's existence when we really imbibe a tradition and make it our own. And in this way, successive generations of intelligent people who have reasonable doubts can come up to that threshold and walk through it and experience you know, a richer world, a deeper world, a more profound world. Just like you know, if you know jujitsu or something like that, it's almost like having a superpower. You just understand the mechanics of the body. And you can put together you know, different kinetic chains and control someone's body by isolating a limb and using the strongest parts of your body against the weakest parts of their body. And it works. And all of a sudden, you're, it's like amazing. It's almost like having a superpower. But it was always there. You just didn't know it. And now you know it. And, and it's like you're in a whole different world. You're in a world of fear. Now you're in a world where you're not afraid. You're in a world of confusion. Now you're in a world where there's clarity. It's amazing what happens when you apply yourself to, you know, and, 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 to, 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 to learning um, like, like powerful systems of knowledge. They enrich the world in which you live and you become powerful. And you can do things. And other people are like, how do you do that? And you're like, well, I can show you how to do it, but you've got to put the work in. It's not just free. I can't show you in a day. There's no three-hour course we're going to teach on it. Maybe a three-year course. But we can have you feeling amazing in three months. And so, you know, I, I, there's other stuff. I mean, I, I wasn't planning. None of this stuff was planned. I just started reading the verses, and these are the thoughts that occurred to me. But... I think we're in a great place here in this section. Krishna is actually making an argument that he's God. And that argument in a religious text about the nature of God and a claim to divinity is really meant for people who are in the intermediate level, who have developed faith in God, who have developed understanding of divinity, and who are qualified to assess a conception of God, who are qualified to read a book in Japanese and tell you what it's about who understand haiku, who understand poetry, who understand art, who understand cinema. And they can go, wow, this is amazing, or this is garbage, or whatever. But they're entitled to an opinion because blind doubt is just as bad as blind faith. We should really reserve judgment until we qualify ourselves to have an opinion. Thank you very much, IGTV.